Welcome to this episode of Moments in Leadership. Real quick, before I read the bio of this episode's guest, since it's the holidays, I'm just going to do a quick personal thank you to a new Supercast supporter and an old friend, Max Peaches Goralnik at the Buy Me a Beer level. Max, thanks for your longtime friendship and support of this project. You and I have always shared a passion for leaving it better than you found it. And frankly, my friends are, and thankfully have always been, my toughest critics. So when they support projects like this, like Max did, it's truly appreciated. So Max, thanks again. Since this is the last episode of the year, I want to provide a quick financial accounting to those who financially support this project. The revenue generated by your generosity helped defray costs, but I also ran a deficit. And that's okay, because hobbies and projects cost money, and I like doing this. But my pledge to everyone who chipped in was that if there were any profits left over at the end after covering costs, I would give them away to veterans' charities. So even though I ran a deficit, I still personally donated $5,000 to Patrol Base Abate and $3,500 to the Station Foundation this year. And links to those organizations can be found in the show notes. And if you're looking for a charity to donate to here at the end of the year, please consider those. Okay, with that, this episode is with Major General Matt Smith, United States Army. And he is the current commanding general of Joint Task Force North, which is headquartered at Fort Bliss, Texas. Prior to assuming command of Joint Task Force North in December of 2022, Major General Smith served as the Vice Director of Operations, the National Guard Bureau, J3, 4, and 7 in Arlington, Virginia from February 2022 to December 2022. His green tab assignments which gets its name from the green tab on the service uniform epaulets underneath the rank insignia when a soldier is in a leadership position, include command of H Company, 121st Infantry Airborne Long Range Surveillance, while the company was deployed to Iraq in 2003. He served as the commander of 1st Battalion, 121st Infantry Regiment, while the battalion was deployed to Afghanistan in 2009 and 2010. And then in 2016, Major General Smith assumed command of the 48th Infantry Brigade Combat Team and commanded that brigade in Afghanistan from 2018 to 2019. His key staff assignments include service as the Deputy Director of Operations G3 for the Georgia Army National Guard, the Division Chief for the National Guard Bureau's J81 Joint Capabilities and Planning Division, and the Deputy Director of Operations Readiness and Mobilization Headquarters Department of the Army G3, 5, and 7. Major General Smith was commissioned as an infantry officer in 1993. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration from the University of Delaware, a Master's in Business Administration from the Goizeta School of Business at Emory University, and a Master's in Strategic Studies from the United States Army War College. He is also a graduate of the Harvard University's Homeland Security Seminar. Major General Smith's professional military education includes the Infantry Officer Basic Course, the Signal Officer Advanced Course, the Military Intelligence Officer Transition and Advanced Courses, Maneuver Captain's Career Course, Combined Arms and Services Staff School, Counterintelligence Agents Course, Command and General Staff Officer Course, the United States Army War College, Joint and Combined Warfighting School, Maneuver Battalion and Brigade Pre-Command Courses, Dual Status Commander's Course, and the Joint Task Force Commanders course. He is also a graduate of the Bradley Leaders course, Airborne, Air Assault, Jump Master, Pathfinder, and Ranger Schools. Major General Smith's personal awards include two Legion of Merits, three Bronze Star Medals, the Defense Meritorious Service Medal, eight Meritorious Service Medals. I mean, maybe I can get him to give me one of them. <laughs> and the Joint Service Commendation Medal, along with numerous campaign medals. He was also awarded the Combat Infantryman's Badge. And while his bio omits this small fact, he also wears the U.S. Army Senior Parachute Badge, as well as the coveted Gold Wings, or as they are more formally referred to, the Navy and Marine. Marine Corps parachute insignia. Finally, he is married to Miss Laura Balzer, who is truly his better half. So with that, Major General Matt Smith, U.S. Army, thanks for coming on the podcast. I am excited to have some more Army folks on here because your experiences and your leadership environments are different, not necessarily unique, but different from what a lot of my previous guests have talked about, you know, Marine-centric. So it's really exciting to have you on. And worth mentioning, the other half of your command team, Sergeant Major Cordero, has recorded as well. So you'll each have your own individual episodes. I'm planning to put those out together. But this is great. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your busy schedule to talk to me and sharing your moments in leadership to help all those emerging leaders out there be leaving it better than we found it, right? Yep, absolutely. 
And uh, thank you, Dave, for giving us both Sergeant Major and I the opportunity. Although I'll leave it to you. We may want to do a tag team in the future because we we riff well off of each other. Yeah, that would be great. I, and I actually did that for listeners. I did that with an episode with uh, Lieutenant General Bellin and then who, who is now Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps, but then Sergeant Major Ruiz. And they did a presentation to a group of second lieutenants down at the basic school. And, and I just mic'd them up. It was like that NFL show, like mic'd up where That's the coaches awesome. are yelling and stuff on the field. But yeah, it was pretty. So I would love to do that. Lo- would love to do that. So in a, uh, I was going to say backhand a compliment. It's not, it's just a straight up compliment to your service culture. I always introduce Sergeant Major Cordero as not needing a mic ever. He mentioned that in the episode. Yes. Here is Sergeant Major Cordero who does not need a microphone. Yes. Yeah. So we, uh, I'll tell you a quick anecdote and it'll tie into to his broadcast or whatever uh, that you did. So when our headquarters, joint headquarters, you know, it's kind of standard staff organization, a lot of civilians, all different flavors of uh, joint service members, but all the soldiers and other service members we have are spread out all over the place Mm -hmm. along the border, south of the border. When the kind of crisis last summer started up, a battalion of Marines showed up as part of the help for Department of Homeland Security. So seeing Sergeant Major Cordero speak to a battalion of Marines was very different <laughs> than yeah, seeing uh, him speak to a <laughs> bunch of colonels and 06s around here. Right, right. It went from G to uh, PG-13 real quick. It, or, yeah, yeah Even quickly. R-rated. Okay, it was yeah. impressive. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure just like the Army too, I just don't know a bunch of them, but like when you reach that level of E-9 experience, the impact that you have when they're talking to the junior enlisted, I, I keep wanting to say Marines, with the junior enlisted soldiers, it's different than if you jumped up and talked to a group of second lieutenants and captains, right? Like it, it's yes. just, they have a conveyed energy in their voice that officers don't have. It's totally different. Yeah, it is. It is. And I love them for it. And that's why everybody generally loves their command team, right? Yep, absolutely. So, yeah. So well, that's great. I'm glad you're getting some uh, some marine experience in there. But oh, yeah. your army through and through. Yeah, and I'm glad to bring diversity to your uh, Thank listening you. audience. That it's rare that the army gets to bring diversity of service representation. Right? Well, here we are. I mean, so so tell me. Everybody just heard your bio, but tell me about Second Lieutenant Matt Smith. Where did he come from? What made you join the army? I won't ask you what why you didn't join the Marine Corps, but. You know, what what made you join the Army? And what was Second Lieutenant Smith like? Infantry officer, go. A, sorry to everybody that have to listen to the bio. But B, uh, more specifically and more seriously. So when I decided to pursue a military journey, I basically saw it as like the next natural step in my Cub Scout to Boy Scout to adult transition. Oh, I'll go be in the woods with guns. Yeah, that's... The next logical thing, right? Right. Every kid's dream. Right. Yeah. And I'll get paid for it. It'll be awesome. Yeah. So um, A, I would say, especially for the junior most uh, listeners in your audience, I did not have a full appreciation for the level of responsibility associated with being a commissioned officer. Yeah. Right. And that came rushing to the forefront during what, you know, went through a series of schools for the first year, go to my first unit, straight into being a platoon leader. That was in August. And then on October 1st, so two months later, we're part of uh, what was then called the division ready for. So like I was in a heavy unit. So I was part of like the the armored portion of the rapid response force or whatever. We What year was this roughly? Fall of 94. Gotcha. So that first weekend where you got Friday afternoon formation, the first sergeant says, okay, everybody, you know, we're on division ready force two, which was like an eight hour recall. And uh, he goes, you guys got to call into the CQ desk. The Marines call it something different, but the guy who mans the phone over the night at the company or battery, right? Yeah. Officer of the day. Yes. So you got to call in every hour or you got to have a beeper, right? This is 94, right? No cell phone. (laughs) <laughs> it's like I just had a flashback to being at the beach with a with surf trunks on and a pager. Right, exactly. I'm shopping for a pager because I don't want to use a payphone every hour to call 
to call in. And I call in the first hour. They're like, oh my God, Lieutenant Smith, you got to get in here. We've just been alerted to deploy. And I'm like, holy cow, this is very different than the Cub Scouts and the Boy Scouts. You know, this is like pretty serious. Yeah. So I get in there. I'm the second to last guy in the platoon to get in. Private Hurst was a very long other story. He had decided to go to Tennessee and uh, almost missed movement. Oh, man. Yeah. So that anyway, good lesson learned for him, but you'll have to talk to him about that. So then platoon leader, or we go on the first flight out, like, you know, leaders, recon, advon, whatever you want to call it. And you're going where? To Kuwait, because Saddam Hussein had moved like a ton of forces south of whatever the no-go line was at that time. So I remember this like it was yesterday because the same thing happened in the Marine Corps. Because we support, we, the Anglico unit supported DRB, DRF. And so we, and I got called off back from Phoenix, Arizona at that exact same time. It's so funny. It's just massive flashback. Yeah. So we, you know, I, I always say it's like you do something like that. It seems like you always land at night, right? And you don't okay. know what's going on. You're all tired from flying halfway around the world. So it's me and coincidentally, my, uh, the guy who was in my squad in ranger school, and now we're platoon leaders in the same company together, Okay, which was awesome. We would sleep like on a pallet somewhere and then wake up the next morning and we are in a motor pool, which is like the pre-po. There's like a brigade at the time, a brigade combat team's worth of pre-poed Bradley fighting vehicles. And at Doha, and was, probably. Yes, right? exactly. At Doha. And we, the sun comes up. And Greg, his name is Greg Roberts. He wakes up and he's like, and what, this is a quote. He goes, shit, Kuwait which is, says so much just in right. and of itself. And I look around and there are first light, you know, pallets as far as you can see of different types of ammunition that I had never seen before, right? So like different colors, you know, the tips of all the various size rounds are all different colors. I'm like, I think I saw a slide on that once, but I've only shot blue tipped. <laughs> you know, for training. Right. No light blue to be seen anywhere, right? Right. Yeah. And it's all orange and red and, you know, all this stuff. And I was like, and I thought to myself after basically sailing through every course at Fort Benning, the infantry school for the Army, uh, straight through, you know, kind of commandant's list kind of stuff. I don't mind saying at the to put this in perspective, like I did very well. And I woke up in that environment and I thought to myself, no kidding. I thought I should have studied harder when I was at Fort Benning. Wow. Because this is like pretty sobering. And then we went up and set a defensive position and waited, you know, dug in and waited for Iraqis to come with T-72s to come across the, right. you know, the trigger line to start firing on. This was a Bradley, you said heavy, right? So it's yeah, Bradley's it was a Bradley and tanks. platoon. Okay. Yeah. You know, cross attached M1 platoon and stuff. Yeah. But like to have that experience in my third month as a platoon leader has shaped the rest of my career. Because the only thing, like what I realized from that is the only thing I'm never going to get back is time. Yeah. And I was not mentally and emotionally, which is a whole separate discussion, prepared to lead you know, then men in our direct action armed combat until like that moment, you know, and I should have studied more. You know, what's interesting about that? Cause I, I hear a lot of people talking about, there's a whole generation of emerging leaders who, who haven't been in combat. And then there's a whole, either that complete component or a subcomponent of that feel like they missed out. My response to that is always, I'm telling you right now, you never know what you don't know. Because you think about all of the things that we think about the big wars, and I'll go backwards, Afghanistan, Iraq, you know, maybe Kosovo, you can throw in there, sure. Somalia, then you're, yeah. now you're down into Grenada and Panama and Desert Steel, Desert Storm, something. Everyone has always felt like, oh, I missed the big one. And then the next thing you know, something else happens. Something else happens. There's a Haiti. There's a, yeah. a, a and, and these things, nobody's really missed anything. No. You just don't know what's coming next and you don't know when it's happening. Yeah. And to your point, like, You've got to know your craft. You've got to know your job because you could get a phone call in the middle of the night and eight hours later be looking at ammunition and not know what it is. Yeah. 
Exactly. And this is, so I've used this line in, you know, kind of initial counseling sessions on the latter part of my career of, you know, to, a, like I just said, time's the only thing we'll never get back. So I wasted all that time messing around at Fort Benning when I could have been studying harder, even though I did fine, you know, academically or whatever. But I wasn't a, a student of the profession as a nascent second lieutenant. Then there's all this stuff, like, and actually General Mattis writes about this, or excuse me, Secretary Mattis writes about this in his book. You know, there's the whole historical aspect of learning from others' mistakes by reading history about the profession. Right. Right. That's like, uh, you know, cheating on the proverbial test in a good way, where, you know, the ultimate perhaps arguably the ultimate sin for a professional military leader is to make the same mistake somebody else made that you could have read about and prevented. Right. You know, and God forbid somebody pays for it with some blood, you know? Yeah. Right. I guess the first thing I would offer is the, the importance of internalizing early, especially for commissioned officers, right? Because so much responsibility is levied as soon as you raise your right hand and take that oath is like really understanding the legal and professional expectations that are behind that oath. And I don't think, at least my ROTC program, although I loved it and learned a lot of great tactical stuff, it was lacking in that regard. You know, and I, there's probably some balance there because you don't want to scare people away, but it's serious business. It's not like, it's not like advanced boy scouting, which is my perception. You know? Yeah, that's interesting you say about because I was an ROTC guy too. And and I you made me just flash back. When I was an ROTC, I was learning things like naval history, Marine Corps history, and PT and land nav. Yeah, a lot of PT, land nav, and rifle marksmanship, right? And some some general squad level five paragraph order, like yeah. orientation, let's call it, right? I kind of wonder if there's a little bit more of an opportunity to be teaching people some of the technical aspects of being a leader earlier on in ROTC. That's that's a really interesting thought. Uh, Navy counterparts in ROTC, they were learning navigation. Sure. That's a great skill. Yeah. I don't really remember what I learned in the Marines other than marching, PTing, land nav, history, squad level, five paragraph orders. And maybe that's enough for ROTC. Maybe it's not. Interesting. Back to your second Lieutenant Smith, right? Mm -hmm. Do you have a story about the first couple of years in your career, or maybe it was even the Kuwait, the Kuwait deployment that you went on, where one of your enlisted soldiers grabbed you and was like, hey, sir, let me save you from making a big mistake. Yes. Yeah, can you tell me about that? Because, <laughs> Absolutely. Right, because all the enlisted soldiers and Marines and airmen and sailors, they, they love these stories, right? Hey, here's General Smith. He's going to tell about the time he screwed up as a second lieutenant. Go. Right. Yeah, so literally the only time I almost messed up land navigation, we we're still overseas. Saddam turned around or whatever. And right. we just spent, you know, basically like three months doing live fire training, which is awesome and an incredible other developmental experience. But anyway, so one night we're moving back to our, you know, kind of defensive positions. I'm like drifting one way. And there no GPS back then. Right. Right. There was a Magellan. I don't know if you remember those, the big green screen thing. It, like, it was, it looked like a book, right? It had yes. a digital, and all it did was tell you the grid square you were at. That's right. That's right. And we had like four of them for that. Like the company, each officer had one basically. Right. Right. Well, in the army, maybe. Right. right. <laughs> in the Marine Corps, like the regimental commander had it. No one else. The low it. budget Marine Corps. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, but I didn't use it because it was freaking gigantic. You yeah. Know? So I'm just like doing it old school, the way I learned mm -hmm. how to do land that. But you're in a desert, a little harder to terrain associate, you know? So I start, and we're lead, I should, I left out the key point, which is we're leading a company movement, right? So like platoons in a wedge, company in a line. So there's like another, what would have been, 10 or 12 vehicles behind the four of us and I'm leading the whole thing. And my wingman, Staff Sergeant McCullough says, hey, sir, you know, on the internal net, I think we need to go a little bit more to the left. And I, um, and as soon as he said it, I was like, 
Roger that. <laughs> we corrected, but it would have been a mess. We would have been like going around in circles in the dark, in the flat, you know, Kuwaiti desert, which many of your lists, more senior listeners have probably experienced. That would not have been a fun time for second Lieutenant Smith. Yeah. All the way up through the Dari range probably. or the, Yes, yeah. exactly. You always hear, well, I feel like officers always hear the jokes about how officers can't land nav and all that. I mean, generally they can. Can't spell loss without LT. Right. <laughs> yes. It, generally they can, but like it, there's, there's such a huge swath for making a mistake, right? It's kind of easy, but from the enlisted soldier Marine perspective, land nav, I think there's two ways that those NCOs can handle it. They can be like lieutenants lost and they don't do anything about it yeah. or the lieutenants lost and are like, Hey, sir. And they save them. For the listeners, uh, the reason uh, Dave gave the caveat about copywriting stuff is this idea I've had or been suggested to me of, hey, you should write a book about some of this. And I'm not, this isn't like all the material that we're going to talk about, but I am contemplating, I haven't done the research yet, so this may already be out there, titling the book on leadership, Don't Be a Jerk. Right? Is that a strong enough word? Well, <laughs> right. for sales on yes, Amazon, right, right, yes. yes, for, for <laughs> right, Barnes and Noble, right, got it, yeah, okay. But to the Marine point, version may be titled something else, right? right? Okay, right. it's just like Amber Sand exclamation point, or whatever. <laughs> um, yeah. So, but to your point, starting from a position of humility as a junior commissioned officer, mm -hmm. recognizing that a you don't know it all. And B, there is priceless wisdom to be gained from all these other leaders that technically work for you. Right. It like Staff Sergeant McCullough, if I had been a different, I think, different type of person, could mm -hmm. have easily let me continue to drift to the right with the company commander behind me and everybody else. Sure. And uh, turned into a cluster. You know? Yeah. I think back to my lieutenant days. And I don't really remember what kind of lieutenant I was. So I'm going to say I was okay. Let's just, okay. I wasn't the kind of officer where people were trying to make me look like an idiot. For the most part, the NCOs would, would grab me and be like, hey, hey, sir, right? So, and I look back on that and I think that was probably one of the most formative things about being a lieutenant was I was at least good enough to where the Marines didn't let me show my ass. Right. Which is a great thing to shoot for. Uh, right. I think so too. But in order to do that, you've got to be a, you've got to have a lot of good EQ. You need to be a likable person. And there, there's a difference between being a likable person and wanting to be liked by everybody. Two, two totally different things, right? That's, that is a huge point. But here's what I always like to say. I'm going to turn this into a birthday ball speech, but the future commandant of the Marine Corps is out on active duty right now and is a lieutenant. Yeah, that's a great point. So there's a four-year swath of being a lieutenant. There's a four-year swath of being a commandant. So there is a lieutenant out there that is going to be the commandant of the Marine Corps. Yeah. I will guarantee you that the probability of success for that lieutenant to actually become the commandant will 100% hinge on the relationship that he or she has with their, and I'm going to use pay grade ranks here to make it, yeah, yeah. E4, E5 NCOs. Right. I know the army E4, but, right. but right. Okay. Junior NCOs. And so boy, oh boy, that's a huge component of your success is how well do you ingratiate yourself to those people who have more experience than you, not necessarily the same authority. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think the flip side of that, that's so important to realize for me, only in retrospect, hopefully this helps some do it proactively. Yeah. Is the nature of that relationship is symbiotic, right? Like right. they need and want you, whether they'll tell you or not, it's irrelevant, but they need and want you to be successful because someday their life may depend on your decision-making. Yeah. You know? Right. And we, especially as commissioned officers should, like I use this line, we should never disregard the council of an NCO, right? So that A, implies you seek the counsel of an NCO, right? B, you listen actively when receiving the answer to whatever question you ask or perspective you see. 
And then C, you consider it before making a decision. The follow-on statement I always make to officers and senior NCOs is, that doesn't mean you do exactly what the NCO says or recommends, but we should never, ever, as commissioned officers, make a decision without at least considering the enlisted perspective, which is like, I don't know what the percentage is, 95% of the force probably. Right. And ultimately, the part of the force that's going to pay in some way for a bad decision. Right. You know? And time is important in that. So if as an officer, you take the time when it's available to you to seek their counsel, seek their input, and make sure that they feel heard, and, and maybe even there's a pretty good chance they have a better idea than you do. No question. The more you do that in training, the more equity you build up for that eventual moment where you don't have time to consult them and you do have to make a decision and that the NCOs are going to say like, Hey, Lieutenant just said to do this. Captain just said to do this. I trust him because we've been working together. I've seen how he, like I trust his decision. Yeah. That's a great point. You can't build that sort of trust without some sort of two way street leadership. The other thing too, about, I was making this point in an earlier episode of a podcast. I don't remember which one it was, but you know, we, we say the, we say the term NCO, like it's a word. And we lose sight of that. It's a, it's truly an acronym because the last word in that is officer. Right. Right. So forget the commission, forget the non commission like the commission, it has some legal implications and yes. it has some implications for how much authority you, you do or don't have. Mm -hmm. But the end of that word is officer. We are all officers together leading troops. Yeah. Don't ever forget that. Yeah. Whether no, you're a commissioned a officer point. or a non-commissioned officer, like you're an officer. Yeah. Act like one and lead like one and take care of the other officers because the non-officers are relying on you to do that. Yeah. You know, so to that point, I always kind of, I'm sure you've had this happen to you. So a, a junior enlisted person or a junior NCO approaches you and asks for counsel about going to like OCS or to ROTC or even to an academy and becoming an officer, right? And although we're like, especially at the, platoon or section level or whatever, you're so close with everybody, the difference doesn't man in my mind anyway, doesn't manifest until much later or an acute situation like being in combat. But anytime somebody does that with me and I say like, well, hey, Sergeant, Staff Sergeant, why do you want to do that? If they say for more money, <laughs> I'm like, hey, that's probably a bad decision, you know, because the prorated you know, the app, whatever it translates to in an hourly wage difference is so far outweighed by the jump in expectations when you actually do commission it. That is a kind of a split in the road, if you will, in terms of expectation, I think. Then there's Captain Smith. So yes. now tell me about who did Lieutenant Smith become? So I became a National Guardsman. Like at the time I was getting promoted to captain, I left active duty to go. Can you clarify that for a second? Because I didn't, yeah. when you said you got a call on a Friday, I thought you were National Guard as a second lieutenant. No, that was, I oh. was at um, Fort Stewart, Georgia, which was back then the 24th Infantry Division. Now okay, the now third. the third ID, right? Yes. Okay. So that first couple of years, regular army guy. I'm sure I wasn't the first nor the last guy to leave regular army from Fort Stewart because of a girl in Atlanta. So pursued that and joined the National Guard. Okay. Like very quickly thereafter, got promoted to captain and, and kind of thrust as a traditional guardsman. So I was a stockbroker at Dean Witter. Okay. When there was a Dean Witter, right? Which I know you and a few others can remember. Sure, yeah. <laughs> Slight aside on that, I always say that that was the late 90s. Yeah, because so like they merged with uh, Morgan Stanley, Morgan right? Stanley. Yeah. yeah. So, but you can. You could do no wrong in the stock market in the late 90s. It was a, there's probably another lesson there in leadership about timing is everything. But well, yeah, uh, because I, I went live in January of 20 of, of 2000. So there you go. Yeah, that's, Talk about uh, timing. Poor timing. <laughs> <laughs> I made it though. I made it. So I was in this company, uh, which it doesn't ex this type of company doesn't exist anymore, but a long range surveillance company. There were a handful of these sprinkled across the nation and in the regular army and in the National Guard. We would jump almost every month, either on the designated weekend or on an additional weekend. And then probably, 
you know, every quarter spend one weekend doing like admin stuff, one weekend doing mission planning stuff, and then the third weekend of the quarter doing, a, you know, a 48 or 72 hour, you know, insert in, hike, foot march a god awful distance with a very heavy rucksack, you know, do an observation thing or perform reconnaissance and then exfil. So it was just a great, and it was in the interwar years, if you will, to use a uh, non-technical term, but it was, you know, post-Clinton downsizing, you know, peace breaking out everywhere. So it was literally like right back to, oh, I'm just hanging out in the woods with guns and doing land nav like in Boy Scouts with a bunch of guys who had left, you know, in Georgia. You had the regimental headquarters of the 75th Ranger Regiment. You had two battalions of the 75th Ranger Regiment. So we had like all this cadre of NCOs at the staff sergeant and up level that were like, I've never seen anything like it since in the subsequent, whatever it's been, 26 years of just talent assembled in this unit. It was fantastic. But at the same time, it was like a tremendous uphill battle once I became the company commander because of these lessons learned that I just spoke about. Like, hey, every minute counts. We only see each other for a couple of days a month. We got to build what we now say, you know, build readiness for whatever's going to come. People are like, what are you talking about? The world, everything. We won the war. The Soviet Union collapsed, you know, this, that, the other. They all thought I was nuts, right? So I do that for a couple of years. Fast forward. This is pretty interesting, actually. Do like in the army, sometimes you do a second company command, which is usually like the headquarters company for the battalion. Okay, yeah, that yeah. happens in the Marines too. Yep. Yeah, so I ended up doing that for a year and then I kind of like go off to like a mid-grade captain school that the army used to have that doesn't have anymore. At the tail end of that, 9-11 happens. So I long since got married and then divorced i'm like well shit i gotta figure out a way to get to afghanistan this thing's gonna be open. you know every conflict you remember it was like start the stopwatch the conflict's gonna be over once the persian gulf war was over in 100 hours everybody thought they were gonna miss out on it yeah right. so i'm like man i gotta get in on the fight right and this goes to your previous point it's like be careful what you wish for <laughs> right and then uh there will be something for everybody along the way right so I think about going over to Alabama, had an SF unit that was going to get mobilized, a guard SF unit that was going to get mobilized to go after us. And I go talk with those guys for a little bit. And then like the weekend after I visit with them, the battalion XO from the unit I just left, where I'd been this LURS company commander and then the headquarters company commander in a, a year prior, calls me, said, hey, we got to relieve the LURS company commander. You want to do company command again? Oh. Right. So I'm like, sure. Why would I? It was so awesome the first time. I might as well. And the LURS, just to my Marine world, I need, the, I need an orientation here. It's a company of long-range reconnaissance dudes. So are they broken into platoons? Like, what is the quick, quick task organization there? So 36 teams, three platoons, six teams each, led by E6s. Okay. And the unit of operation is the team. It's the six-man team. So it's the legacy structure from the LERPs in Vietnam, Okay. basically. Okay. So six-man teams, what are lieutenants doing in that company? Managing the planning process, resupply if necessary, infill, exfill. Okay. You know, gotcha. was, so the way we did it is that, so the platoon leaders were usually, we tried to get like first lieutenants who had already been like, line platoon leaders you know sure mm -hmm. because it is it's not like the traditional platoon leader experience because the staff sergeant's leading the, the element so i go back into this company which take you know interesting uh, the leadership lesson here for everybody is if you take over for somebody who just got relieved you pretty much can do no wrong yep it'll require hard work but it's pretty easy to show a quick return on the investment of the hard work, right? And actually, worth mentioning, I never really thought about it in this context, the reason the guy got relieved is because he didn't follow standards. 
Okay. Right. So if you're in an airborne unit and you fail to follow standards, sometimes people get hurt. Sure. So this guy, you know, the war had started in Afghanistan and we were in a suburb of Atlanta where this unit was located and CNN, which is headquartered in Atlanta, wanted to do some sort of thing with the military because this war just started in Afghanistan. They're going on one of the weekend jumps, rotary wing jump out of UH-60 Blackhawks. And the camera crews and the trail offset, you know, uh, helicopter. And the a very small drop zone controlled by the guy on the ground for those that understand that kind of thing. You know, sometimes you're doing it from the aircraft. Sometimes you're doing it from the ground. Guy on the ground. Veers drop zone? Veers. Yes. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Right. Yes. Oh, look at you. Uh, hey, man, I'm a Pathfinder too. Yeah. <laughs> Pathfinder says execute, execute, execute. Company commander is next to like the reporter and the camera person on, on the headset. The camera guy's like, I don't have the shot yet. So they hold execution for like three seconds or something like that. Less than 10 seconds. And then they execute. And they put an entire lurse team in the trees. One guy breaks his back. Another guy breaks his femur, you know, just bad because he didn't follow the standard. You know, that the guy on the ground is the one that makes the call in that situation. And for, I guess, the glory of extra advertising revenue for CNN, they got six guys pretty badly hurt. Let me ask a question here, because I think this is fascinating. There is a listener out there who's going to find themselves taking over command from someone who got relieved. Okay. Like battery commander shoots out, battery commander gets relieved. New captain comes in. Yep. Can you give some, what worked well, what didn't work well from a cultural perspective? Like how do you as captain Smith walk in there and say like, all right, you don't walk in and say like, I have arrived. Right. I'm here to save the day. What is a tip based on your experience with that, that you can give to an emerging leader who will find themselves, himself, herself in that position someday in the future, based on your experience, what sort of advice do you have for him? So that is a great question that makes me think I should think about this more. Listeners can't see me, but my dad always used to say when I was growing up, oh, Matthew, you're sharp as a marble. And then I shaved my head and he said, oh, and now you look like one. <laughs> so this is a sharp as a marble observation that Anytime I have talked about that experience of coming in after this guy got relieved, it always gets questions from junior people that are listening to me talk about it. So I need to, my takeaway there is I just, to your point, I just need to make this part of the proverbial repertoire when talking to junior folks, because it was, it was more traumatic for the other guy, but it wasn't easy for me. That's kind of what I was getting at. Was yeah. There's not a change of command. No. <laughs> There's no, right? No changing the guide on. Yeah. So what happened? Like, so to that point, I, the first GO in the chain of command walks by the room where I am waiting with the captain and trail. And then the XO comes in, the battalion XO comes in and says, okay, you're up. And I walk down the hall into like the kind of garage bay area behind the headquarters. And, um, you know, there's a hundred and 50, you know, airborne ranger guys in there. And I get like, get up on a stack of three pallets and I'm like, okay, man, I'm the company commander now. Right. You know, <laughs> and then what happens? Well, you know, we just had, you know, a team of their buddies get badly hurt. It was like, how do we kind of put Humpty Dumpty back together again? Cause they all felt like crap. Right. Yeah. You know, so it, like in the airborne community, some some of the listeners will know this. Like when you're a jump master, you always say to the other jump masters when you're doing pre-jump prep and training, hey, did I miss anything? Right. So this idea of um, I assume this cuts across services like air quotes, everybody's a safety officer. Yeah. Anybody could have stopped that accident from happening. Yeah, that's true. You know, like everybody knew it was a six second drop zone and they waited three seconds or whatever. Right. And that kind of lesson could probably be applied uh, across the board to any branch, any functional area or whatever in any service. There's always room for common sense to step in and prevent somebody from making a bad decision. Right. Right. So to that point, the first task straight to your question, Dave, is 
how do you put Humpty Dumpty back together again? Yeah. And it was right back to the basics. We're going to, you know, we're not, we're canceling all future airborne operations and we're starting with airborne refresher training. Remediation. Yeah. And you just start building back from that. It was interesting. Okay. Just a quick reminder that if you can help support the project, there are links in the show notes to my Supercast site, which has membership levels to help me defray the costs associated with this project. Any money I have left over at the end of the year is donated to veterans organizations. And you can also find links to merchandise, which helps as well. And of course, leaving reviews on Apple Podcast, my YouTube channel, or Spotify are also free ways to help with this project as well. Thanks. That gets me onto like, uh, I'm building a soapbox to stand on here someday, but when we talk about safety and risk aversion, I, I have this, I don't know, if I was going to write a PhD dissertation and defend it, I, I just have an MBA. But <laughs> I stop I didn't want to do it. Defend a dissertation. I'm going to make some money. So if I was going to create a dissertation and defend it, I come back to this risk thing. I was recently having a conversation with somebody about safety stand down. There was a safety stand down that happened in the Marine Corps recently because there was an Osprey crash, there was an F-18 crash, there was a, um, a howitzer that shot where it wasn't supposed to, and there was a hum, uh, Humvee, a JLTV that was that was destroyed. Yeah. And so lots of stuff all happened at once. And when that happens, just like in the Army, I suppose, there's so, somebody says like, time out, safety stand down. So I was asking this other senior Marine leader, like, what good does a safety stand down do at the infantry battalion when it's an Osprey crash, an F-18 crash, and a howitzer that shoots out, right? And I was just, I don't know, I was throwing a little gas on the I was just trying to have an interesting conversation. And this idea came up uh, a couple episodes ago. I had a Vice Admiral Bill Murs on, who was a nuclear submarine officer. And he was talking about how when there's a, a problem on a nuclear submarine, which, by the way, big deal, right? Right. <laughs> Only if it's underwater. Yeah, I know some guys went into the trees, but like, you know, nuclear reactor. Right. Okay. So higher GT score. On that <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but he was saying that that when there's a mistake made, their version of a stand down is they they decertify somebody and then they have to go through a whole certification process again. And what that means is that they've got to go through every single station, whatever. Yeah. And that requires every single chief or officer that is in charge of that station to freshen their skills up because they have to recertify that person. Yeah, and I said, I said, but at the end of the day, that person's getting, there's no recourse. There's no adverse evaluation. There's no getting hmm. fired. They literally remediate the person and bring them back into the fold. And they say, you have earned the right to be a watch stander again. Wow. So never, and I said the same thing too. Wow. I thought, okay. That's pretty interesting. Right. What if our safety stand downs were just remediations? Like, hey, like you were just talking with the airborne thing. You start over with the basics. Guys, we're going to take the pathfinders out. We're going to talk about viewers. We're going to talk about how to calculate the offsets, yes. how to read the wins, how to yeah. do the execution. And hey, jump masters, we're going to talk about when you hear execute, execute, execute. That's when you're tapping guys out the door. And I just wonder if there's some sort of conversation to be had at any service, at any level about stand downs versus remediation. What if the safety stand downs were, if for the next 72 hours, let's research everybody on, on the important things that they do. And in a howitzer section, it could be just how to load the gun and shoot. And we're going to just go through all the steps of checking the fuse setting and checking deflection, right. margin elevation, things like that. In the infantry, it could be like, hey, just basic loading and unloading, disannounce of the weapon, like any of those things. Yeah. I, I don't know. Sidebar. That's an interesting thought. Yeah. But now as a captain in your career. Oh, wait, can I just talk about like, so let me, on the topic of safety. Oh, please. This is your podcast. So yeah. here's something I'm sure the Marine Corps is virtually infallible, but here's a, a cultural problem I've seen within our, my beloved army. Okay. And that is like, we talk about safety and we talk about risk management as a way of maintaining safe behavior or trying to, right? But for the vast number of years in the earlier part of my career, nobody is certainly as a, as a company grade officer, nobody ever put it in the context for me of being in combat. Okay. So in retrospect, and what I try to pay for now, and hopefully somebody listening gets something out of this, the whole reason we do safety with air quotes or risk mitigation more formally is because what we do in this profession of arms is inherently dangerous, right? Even right. in training, it's dangerous as 
per the previous examples you gave and that I talked about. So anytime we're doing risk management, which should of course be all the time as leaders at Echelon, I think we should be constantly foot stomping for the you know, junior most member of the fire team or whatever. Hey, the reason we're talking about this is because when we go to combat, we got to do the ultimate most dangerous thing we do, but we want to do it as safely as possible, which sounds counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's why we rehearse arrival on the objective at the correct time and not arriving early while the preparatory fires are still happening. Right. For example, right. The combined arms rehearsal is a risk management tool in a way. Yeah. And that if we do risk management, if we conduct risk management, we make it part of the culture of our units at Echelon, you're going to better prepare the unit, whatever it does for the military, for combat. Yeah. Because you don't just like stop or you shouldn't just stop considering the different types of risk when you go into combat. You right. Know? Yeah. It's also, it's also a function of properly and i don't know if we really train this very well but it's understanding the difference between possibility and probability absolutely right yeah. and i think what ends up happening is sometimes leaders will fall into the if it's possible we're not going to do it yeah which is the right. exact wrong thing to do yeah i use this example a lot and i don't know if it makes sense to everybody it will make sense to you if you've been anywhere around the mortars but there's rules where like you can't transport the propellants <laughs> with the with the high explosive rounds and you can't put the fuses with the, all this stuff. I'm sure that somebody assessed the possibility of that being a catastrophic transportation event. Right. But right. if you think about the way artillery is packaged, the dunnage, the, the shipping, all that stuff, the probability of something happening between a propellant and a high explosive charge at that, there's a higher probability of the battery box catching on fire right. and igniting those rounds, then there is that this propellant. Like sometimes we just make really silly decisions and then they become institutionalized. That, well, that's what I was just thinking as you were saying that. It's like one of the things I talk to people about, and this is a great kind of thing for any leader at, at Echelon, is like the why, like asking, well, why are we doing this this way? So that, I don't know, but that example that you just gave, that could have started when we used caissons for all I that, know. That's right. You right. know, yeah. technology and packaging and other things, you know, have evolved significantly since then. So maybe it, the risk has been mitigated sufficiently that we don't have to do it anymore, but we still do it because do it's it become, is? you know, part of the right. culture of the field artillery. Yeah, right. Exactly. So as Captain Smith, yes, I'm going to ask you to think about yourself as senior Captain Smith. So maybe I, I like, was. okay, like was. already been selected for promotion major. At that point in your career, you've had an awesome vantage point to see leadership up and down, right? You've seen lieutenants working for you. You've seen lieutenants when you were a lieutenant and you've seen captains, majors, colonel, and then you're a company commander. So you've had a lot more interaction with the battalion commander, maybe even regimental commander, or brigade commander. And then you've got the lieutenants and staff and CEOs and first sergeants that are working for you. Can you tell me what the best lesson you ever learned from the worst leader you ever saw at that point in your career? I'm trying to think of who the worst one was. There were so many. Ouch! <laughs> well, to put that in context, there were so many good ones too. Yeah, but, sure. So the Guard, the Army National Guard, was very different prior to the start of the global war on terror than it is today. Right. I think back then, at that time, before we invaded Iraq, uh, when I was back in that company, there were a lot of people who were just like viewed being in the guard the way I thought about initially thought about my army services. Like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to go play in the woods for the weekend. Then, you know, everything changed once everybody got into heavy rotation, even the guard and reserve components of all the services, I think, over the subsequent 20 years. Right. So in terms of learning from bad leaders, I mean, like those lessons, they were not bad people which is a whole separate problem, right? And those 
leaders are out there. And there's, there's a very small number in my observation and assessment, but there are like sociopathic people out there that are unfortunately in some in charge of some number of other human beings within our Department of Defense. And but fortunately, I think we do all the services seem to do a pretty good job of screening those out early on. But anyway, I think the this will be kind of repetitive, but the the kind of lack of professional emphasis on what was really at stake probably, you know, cost some unmeasurable number of people to get hurt or killed because we didn't, we as a, certainly in the guard, we did not realize that, oh, we may actually one day have to do this for real. It just wasn't a thing. I mean, you set 100 hours of desert storm, you know, it just, nobody ever thought, unless you had one of those significant developmental experiences previously, no one ever thought we were actually going to have to go to war. Like when I would talk to that same company, and these guys are like pipe hitters. They're all like, like I said, Airborne Ranger guys out of the special operations community. They're like, we're not going to war. What are you talking about? You know, it was just a very different time. I'd love to ask you, because it's an easy question to ask and maybe a hard question to answer because you're a general officer. Mm -hmm. But can you tell a story about a personal failure of your own? that was really formative to you and is also instructive to tell the story about. Yeah. So this is related to the, my earlier comment about the guy that got relieved not paying attention to standards, right? Or not considering why standards are in place. Like I've never read this in any military document anywhere, but I think all our services have all these rules and regulations or standards of different flavors as part of some past transgression. Somebody transported the ammo wrong <laughs> yeah. and the caisson blew up and we're like, well, we can't do that again. But that like applies to property accountability and applies to how we do maintenance on wheeled vehicles. I mean, everything, right? So discipline and adherence to standards. Here's, here's the lesson I use. I will use this in a couple of days, I think uh, 10 days when I do my first initial counseling for these new forces coming in to help. Homeland Security here on the south southwest border. So there I am. I'm back in this company with all these pipe hitting guys. We get the call on it. We're in a guard unit, right? One week, maybe two weekends a month, like I said earlier. We get called on a Tuesday in uh, February of 2003. Hey, report to the Army, Armory, excuse me, on Friday, bring everything the Army has ever issued you. And I'm like, what do you think? You know, I got the first call. I was the company. What are you talking about, sir? Hey, we're going to war. We're invading Iraq. I was like, what? You got to be kidding me. <laughs> I'm in the guard, you know? <laughs> so anyway, that happens. Three weeks later, we're landing in Kuwait again. And we end up on this pretty unique mission as part of the OIF, what became known as OIF-1, right? So the Marines and 3ID roll through, everything's smoking, and they, you know, it went as similar to Desert Storm, much quicker than anybody thought. Thankfully, no chemical weapons use, because that was a real thing back then. I always think about that when I get like a waiver request for a guy who wants a beard. I'm like, we'll see how, you know, devout you are about your beard when you're facing a Scud missile with like, you don't know what on it, right? Uh, and a lot of funny stories about that. Saw a guy deliberately inject himself with atropine one time because he thought we were being gassed. That did not end well for him, but that's a whole funny separate thing. Anyway, so we, um, this company of all these pipe hitting guys gets assigned because the war's over. So there's no mission for a long race surveillance. And are you in trucks? Like you're not in Bradley's. We're right? in soft sided Humvees. Okay. So you're like a Marine Corps unit. Yes. But with better rifles. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's another funny story, actually, for junior leaders. So we get issued, you know, we're in the Georgia Guard. Yeah. Yet a couple months beforehand, they issue us M4 carbines with ACOGs and uh, CCO, close combat optics. We're like, holy cow, this is so cool. You know, this is awesome. Yeah. Well, it turns out they did that because the war was coming. You know, so if you're a unit... Yeah. Now for the leaders out there, your unit just out of the blue starts getting all this new super high speed new kit. 
you may want to get your personal affairs in order. That's what I yeah, Especially if you're a Marine, because they don't hand out new That's stuff. That's right. Anything. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like you get a new set of boots issued in the Marines. You better like get your will set. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Some new skill crafts get pa- passed out in green notebooks, right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. So anyway, we end up, uh, they take this company of infantrymen and they say, okay, we're going to have you guys do security for these scientists and MI guys that are, it was like a subset of looking for the weapons of mass destruction. Right. We're not like working with JSOC or anything, but we're shepherding these, uh, you know, five I MI personnel, a bunch of civilian scientists and stuff around looking for enemy equipment to be exploited. Right. So we'd get like a somehow get like a report that says, hey, go. There are MIGs buried in the desert out west of Fallujah. Go check it out. Right. So we would go do that. Anyway, so the lesson here comes from the situation. So this thing's led by an Australian Brigadier General. I'm still in touch with fantastic leader. We get in our first firefight that involved, a, you know, it was like a complex ambush, IED, when nobody knew what an IED was. And, and the guys perform well. They kill the bad guys. And we do an AAR, which is another great lesson. You don't just do AARs in training like we did an AAR for the combat engagement. It was very instructive because nobody had ever been in one before. Right. Know? And then the Australian brig here says, hey, you know, in his awesome accent, he says, man, why don't you have the boys come over and we'll, uh, we'll have a Foster's tonight. Just take the edge off. So I think to myself, back then, I G01 was a thing even back then, in the earliest days. I know U.S. forces aren't supposed to have alcohol. But these are all guys I had served with previously as their company commander. Now I'm their company commander again. We're on the time after the first I'm like, what could be the harm? What are the, forget that policy. This I just had this Australian one star telling me we could have a beer. Nobody gets schnocker. We're not doing keg stands or anything. But everybody goes and has one of those giant fosters because the allied partners are not under the same constraint right so this is impossible to prove but i feel a tremendous sense of responsibility for knowingly violating that written standard because fast forward a couple months that just became the sop nobody's getting schnockered but we'd have an engagement enemy engagement and do an ar Go over to the Australian compound and have a beer. That failure on my part in some small way, maybe a major way, contributed to one night, one of our platoon sergeants who had been a uh, team leader in the 75th Ranger Regiment, Regimental Recon. So this guy is static line jump master, military free fall jump master, scuba, done all manner of I don't know what up at the farm in Virginia. You know, just arguably one of the best trained guys in the U.S. Army at that time outside of special operations. He goes over to see some of his buddies in the JSOC compound. He's coming back, low light, you know, Humvee headlights weren't back then very good. The driver, E5, sees an obstacle on the road, swerves to miss this pothole obstacle thing and flips the Humvee, kills the E7. Ugh. Humvee lands on the driver on his femurs, and he's crippled for life. And my lesson, which is this is a very long story to get to the point, is in some small way, my knowing violation of that written standard, which was there as a risk mitigation measure, mm-hmm. right, led to Sergeant First Class Chris Willoughby's accidental death. Because he was out having a beer, and by God, the company commander had previously endorsed having a beer. You know, like I can talk about it now without breaking down, but for years I could not talk about it. And just I would just reflect on it, reflect on it. How do I attempt in some lame effort at a mea culpa to his wife and two young sons to turn this in this lesson into something good so now i talk about it all the time and i always put it in the context of hey all these standards are there for a reason they've probably been 
notwithstanding the potential stupidity of how we transport mortar rounds and fuses, <laughs> they've probably been put in place because of some significant transgression in the past. Yeah. Understand why they're in place. Like that's the ask why question. And if those conditions still exist, like if those reasons for putting the standard in place still exist, then follow them because you don't want to learn this lesson the same way I did. Yeah. You said that it took a while for you to get over it. I suspect that any emerging leader listening to this is going to face a very similar situation where they feel responsible for a death. Do you have some advice on things that helped you kind of reconcile that and then make some progress to where you are today where you can actually talk about that story? Or was it just time? So A, talking about it helps to that point you just made. There is a, it's not a euphemism, let's call it a cliche, I I don't know. I don't know what the right word is, but the phrase time heals. Yeah. That is a thing. I believe it too. Yeah. I mean, I think any of us that have been in this, as I jokingly say, the two-way live fire environment can attest to that. Kind of a reverse question of what I just asked, but how about a time where you just, I know as leaders, we're all relatively humble, some more than others, but- Was there ever a time where you looked at yourself and just said, like, I just did a great job there? (laughs) A moment where you were proud of yourself. I have them. I know you have them. Will you tell me what one of them? So I don't I don't have like an acute one. Okay. Battalion command turned out to be pretty good for me. And there was a All right, let's talk about battalion command. Okay. And the so the like the I went into this rifle battalion, so light infantry uh, battalion. As I got promoted to lieutenant colonel, you know, which is, I think, roughly the case in, in most of the ground services. And knowing that at that point we're in heavy rotation, even for the guard uh, overseas. So knowing the battalion was going to Afghanistan and the battalion's first deployment to Iraq, it had been broken up like the flag didn't get campaign credit. You know, like the companies got added into other battalions to make them whole. And then they came home, kind of put everybody back together. And there was like this tremendous victim mentality. Like, oh, woe is us. You know, we all got sent to the four winds. And um, it was just like a pity party. Yeah. You know? So my predecessor, pretty high energy guy, great leader, had the mission of a hey, get these guys back together. You know, so his command tenure was focused on that, not knowing that, you know, was going to come up on rotation so quickly. And then I got thrust in there like, hey, you got 10 months and we're getting on airplanes, you know? Yeah. The mission in Afghanistan was like the mentorship mission. This was 09. Okay. So it was the mentorship mission of the Afghan National Army, Afghan National Police, because that's what we did with guard combat arms units back then. And we get over there, we start doing that which is a pretty good mission for, uh, you know, reserve combat arms unit because you got a lot of police officers. Like halfway, not even halfway through, it was probably like four or five months in, the guy who was the 82nd command, it was actually uh, Curtis Scaparotti. He finished up as uh, Supreme Allied Commander in UCOM before he retired, which is like the best job title ever. But he was a 82nd Airborne Division commander at the time. And he and his team made a decision that, hey, these guard units, we can like make them into combat power. And without any train, like all the pre-deployment training was focused on mentoring Afghans. Yeah. And then a couple months in, they're like, okay, here's your province of Afghanistan. You're the battle space owner. Here's your provincial reconstruction team with the State Department and the agribusiness development team and the USAID guy, get after it, Lieutenant Colonel Smith. And I'm like, that turned to my XO. I'm like, okay, what do we do now? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And it turned out it went pretty well by all regards. I got some indirect feedback well after the fact, which was extremely satisfying to your point about, hey, I just did a good job. It was I didn't realize it at the time it was happening. So to my comment earlier, it wasn't acute. But to get unsolicited feedback later after such a formative, you know, battalion commands is a very, very formative assignment for any officer or sergeant major. Right. That was just tremendously satisfying in retrospect. Like I knew it was going good, but I didn't know it was going that good. Right. 
this is a question for you as a general officer. Can you share with us your philosophy of mission command? Yes, I can. <laughs> so every because I'm in a joint billet, every service has this philosophy in it. Some they we call it, even the Marines call it different, but like I can do this handout to everybody. Well, here's what the Air Force says, here's what the Navy says, here's the Marines, here's the Army. Army calls it mission command. It's the secret sauce for the U.S. military, in my mind. The other part of the secret sauce is our beloved NCO core, which cannot be replicated even by our Five Eye partners, right? Concur. Just because of our culture as Americans, right? It's just right. awesome. Those of you that haven't worked with others, allied nations will find that out. But anyway, mission command is a way of thinking and a way of uh, planning for and executing missions is part of the secret sauce. So the example I always use is episode two of the Band of Brothers, which of course is an army series about the army's involvement in the largest amphibious operation ever. I have no idea what you're talking about. Which, for which the Marines <laughs> apparently were too busy. But anyway, I couldn't, couldn't resist that. Go ahead. Yes, yes. Um, so anyway, episode two, Lieutenant Dick Winters knows what his mission is. Company commander dies. It's just a mess, the jump in the Normandy, right? Which right. everybody's tracking at this point. And he just, he knows what the purpose of the mission is which is a key foot stomp for everybody, especially the most junior listener. The task, take the hill. Take hill, one, two, three, four, is much less important than the purpose, for example, to destroy the enemy forces on hill, one, two, three, four. If the enemy right. is on hill, one, two, three, five, go destroy the enemy. Don't go right. to hill, one, two, three, four, right? Right. So that's a key part of my answer to your question right commander's intent yes task and purpose yes right yep and the purpose the why being the most important thing everybody's got to understand that down to the last guy in the last rank right because dick winters landed by himself without a weapon and then he just started gathering people up to execute the purpose of his mission right so great example watch it again if you haven't watched it in 20 years yeah. or whatever I love that show. So it's just so full of it's everything. So much leadership. Right? right. I hear people make fun of Captain Sobel. Right. Yeah. And this is just a quick one for the listeners. I'm going to let you jump back into it. But like, yeah. look, no officer aspires to be Captain Sobel. No. So get off that. He thought he was doing the right thing. Yeah, he did. But nobody. <laughs> right. Yeah. OK. Carry on, sir. So, <laughs> so for commissioned officers who are at some point going to be commanders. Yeah. Write your own commander's intent. Like when I hear of people who, and I've like seen this happen with 06s, a guy said to me, hey, yeah, I, you know, I, for the first time I wrote my own commanders. And this guy's like in his second year of brigade command or regimental command for the Marine Corps. I'm like, what are you talking about, man? Yeah. The most important thing is the mission. And the most important that is the, of that is the purpose. So if you're the person, guy or gal in charge, and you're not writing it yourself, you're like missing the whole reason of why we're here, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then here's where the NCO Corps comes in. Communicate it in a way so that people understand it. And I, I would offer that the NCO Corps is the ultimate kind of echo not echo chamber is a bad phrase but like the f ultimate feedback mechanism for whether you communicated it effectively because again the last soldier marine sailor air force airman has to understand what the commander wants to accomplish and why yeah does that make sense it makes total sense and it's absolutely correct if you can understand and I say it all the time in my civilian job here. You know, I mean, you know the folks here. I, I yeah. say, hey, the, the intent of this thing is to do X, Y, Z. Yes. And they understand what I mean by like Marine Army got, get it like that. Right. They, they, I have to like explain what I mean by that. But then once I did, I'm like, hey, the intent is to get this done. Like, I don't care how you do it. Just, right. you know. Yeah. And that resonates even in civilian leadership. Too. So the things that people learn about commander's intent and, and mission orders and things like that in the military, it, it carries over really well into the civilian world too. So I'm glad to hear that because at some point I'm going to have to retire. 
<laughs> I think you'll be very successful. I know this got squeezed in. Hats off to uh, Sergeant First Class Simmons for for helping out with all of this. Yeah. Really appreciate him. And Ed, your whole PA team there. Thank you. Yeah, I'll let him know. You and I talked really quickly before we started recording about doing this again, having you and Sergeant Major Cordero get on there together. I would love to do that. I know, I know we kind of squeezed this in, but I'd love to have you back on because I feel like we could have talked for a whole nother hour about all of this stuff. It's just fantastic to hear other services talk about, which is essentially the same thing with just some different language. I'll end it with this question. Okay. Beret or patrol cover? Oh, PC. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Are, is the Army wearing berets anymore? I don't really notice. Rarely. Sometimes okay. you'll see them in a, in a uh, ceremony, like a change of command or something, but very rarely. Yeah. I know so. you guys are probably jealous of our eight point covers too, but that's okay. They're very attractive, very handsome. They are. They, they really are cool. They're cool. I like yeah. them. They're cool. Yeah. Sergeant so. Major always places his in a prominent location. <laughs> Is he starching it and like blocking it and everything? I don't know like, what he does to it, but everything like beads off of it. I've never seen it not be eight pointed. Yeah. You know? yeah <laughs> <laughs> it That's may great. be like titanium for all I know. It, it, it could be, right. It's probably got three cans of spray starch on it. <laughs> That's but, right. Yeah. Well, hey, sir, thank you so much. Really appreciate this. I know your your wisdom and, and everything that you've learned throughout your infantry community time and your leadership time and what you're doing now. I definitely got to get you back on, sir, so we can talk about this some more because we didn't even hit on brigade command. So we got, we'll got we definitely have to do this again. It all starts with being a lieutenant. Right? Uh, that's right. Right. So, so, I, so there's a song by uh, a guy named Baz Luhrmann, which is really just a, uh, it's like a graduation speech set to a beat. Okay. And there's a one of the last lines, and it's basically like a series of random pieces of advice. Okay. And one of the last lines is, and this is for, again, for the youngest or most junior listener, you know, it, advice is like, I think the, the, the line is, is like pulling the past from out of the disposal. Think of the nastiest disposal you can, in the sink, you know, washing it off and recycling it for something more than it's worth. So every comment I've made to your listeners is offered in that way where it's like, I just want the next generation to be better than I have ever been on my best day. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I'm enjoying this project so much. It's getting people to share their stories to make those emerging leaders be better than the ones that you and I were. Yeah. Not that we were bad, but everybody could be better. So really appreciate your time, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Dave. Thanks for the opportunity. All right. Thank you, sir.